Well, good morning, beloved children of God, and welcome to the Boulder City United Methodist Church Service of Worship. Friends, we are an inclusive church. It doesn't matter what your background has been. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or your ethnicity. And it doesn't matter whom you love. What does matter is that there is a God who loves you deeply. And this God desires to have a wonderful relationship with you. So as we worship God this morning, let's make sure we give God our best. Amen. And now, please join me in our lighting of the Advent wreath call to worship. Hear now these words from the prophet, uh, I mean from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 55. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent, was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of its kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of, for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and ex exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and His holy is His name. His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. During the season of giving, we pause to open our hearts, our minds, our spirits to receive God's blessings. We proclaim with Mary, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. We have witnessed God's restoration in the midst of brokenness. We have prepared ourselves for Christ's coming, and we have proclaimed with faith the promise of God's generous righteousness. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices with my Savior. And now we stand with welcome hearts, waiting to receive our spirit's hunger for the coming of hope. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. Fill us, O God, with restoring love. Prepare us for the coming of your holy child. Encourage us to proclaim the good news to all people. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. And like Mary, we are God's lowly servants. As we light this fourth candle of Advent, 
May we receive with Mary's openness and trust. Let us prepare to receive God's gift of hope. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Savior. Amen. Now, friends, let us pray. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel, God with us. You came to us long ago as a helpless babe, as one in need of human love and care. You taught us how to love and care for one another. Help us to hold on to childlike wonder, amazement, and love, and help us to love one another all year long. Guide our feet into the way of peace, as only the Prince of Peace can lead us, as laying down our lives for one another and serving one another. In the name of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray. Amen. Now, friends, our sermon series, Companies Coming, continues today, Waiting on the Threshold. I invite you now to hear these words from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, 16. Now when the king was settled in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? Have I not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle? Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly." from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. And may the Holy Spirit help the church understand these words for our lives today. Well, we've been waiting for Jesus for over 2,000 years now, right? The second coming, the second advent. We have been on the threshold waiting. The world has been on the threshold waiting. It's been a long wait. And I'm sure that I know that I'm eager to welcome Jesus for his second coming. But we're also on the threshold of Christmas. It's just a few days coming up now. And I'm eager for that as well as I'm sure we all are. But we put ourselves in the place of those before that first Christmas. For there was hope in that time that that God would bring change to the world. The world needed it. The people of Israel, God's people needed it. But about a thousand years before that first Christmas, God was working for change in the life of the Israelites. They had settled down in the promised land. They experienced the the ups and downs with clashes of of people who lived in the the neighboring territories. 
recall, and you heard it in the scripture as well, that God had to raise up judges to, to bring help and aid to God's people when they misbehaved. And then came the last judge, Samuel. Remember Samuel? God directed Samuel to anoint Saul as king. Saul did okay at first, but then fell out of favor with God. And so God called up Samuel again and said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse. And I want you to anoint one of his sons. And remember that all these wonderful sons of Jesse were lined up. And, and Saul looks at each one, but still not one. And then there's that one, that shepherd boy who's out in the field right now. So he's called in. Saul, God says, this is the one, this shepherd boy. So, David now has, a, has been anointed, the next king of Israel. Of course, this is still while Saul is king of Israel. And, and you might recall all the drama that happens between David and Saul until ultimately, during a battle, Saul falls on his sword and dies. And that David had worked hard now to build the, the coalition of the, the tribes of Israel to make them into one nation, unified by one king. And it, it's finally happened. It's finally happened. And he makes Jerusalem the capital of God's people. And now David gets to rest, you might say. He gets to kick back in his nice cedar house, kick back and relax because he's been delivered from all of his enemies and he can take rest now. But think about it. David has this very nice house built of cedar. Probably has good landscaping as well. And probably one day when he's walking out, he notices out in his backyard that next to the backyard, there's this tent, the, the tabernacle of God. How does that compare to the place that David is living in? So David gets this bug. He decides that he wants to build a house for the Lord. He wants to build a temple for God. You know, I can remember nights when uh, I was camping out of my little pup tent outside our big house. I imagine that kind of perspective was the same for, for David, this small thing compared to his big thing that he's living in. But again, that didn't sit right with David. God should have a nice place too. The writers of, from homiletics, they share this, interesting things. King David, who has many wars and battles yet ahead of him, who has yet to commit adultery with Bathsheba, who has yet to engineer the death of Bathsheba's husband, who has yet to do anything to avenge the rape of his daughter Tamar by Ammon, his son, who has yet to deal with the rebellion of another son, Absalom, is thinking of building a house, a house for the Lord, for his heavenly parent. They also share... It's hard to know the king's motives. And one can speculate, however. Perhaps there's a quid pro quo idea lurking in David's heart. If he does something for God, God will continue to do some things for him. In such an attitude, in that time frame, in that uh, era of time, that, uh, that attitude was hardly uncommon. And especially in the Bible, people have always bargained with God. Think about this. Abraham bargained with God about Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 18. Jacob bargained with the wrestler, Genesis 22. Moses struck a deal with God to save the Israelites in the aftermath of the golden calf, Exodus 32. And then Jephthah made a bargain that cost his daughter's life, Judges 11. Hannah bargained for a son, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And then when he was on his deathbed, King Hezekiah argued for 15 more years of life. That's 2 Kings chapter 20. However, I think David did want to show his gratitude toward God for delivering him from his enemies. And so David calls upon the prophet Nathan and says, Nathan, I got this idea. I want to build God a temple, a place for God to be. And of course, Nathan is enthusiastic about this. Go ahead, David, do it. And then that night comes, and the Lord comes to Nathan and says, Hold on, Nathan. This is what I want you to tell David. 
Why should, you know, it's okay for me to live in a tent. And, and God ticks off the reason why it's okay. Being with the people since the Exodus, being through their trials and tribulations, God never did say, oh, by the way, as we're progressing in our journey here, why don't you make my furnishings a little better? No. No, God doesn't need that. Think about this now, centuries later, that Peter, James, and John are with Jesus on that mountain of transfiguration. And in the midst of this terrible experience when Jesus is transformed to a vision of dazzling whiteness, and there appear with him Elijah and Moses, Peter comes out of the one of the most short-sighted statements of all time. He offers to build three shelters, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. Jesus doesn't favor Peter with a, a reply. It's kind of like what God did with David. <laughs> Peter's so busy doing what he thinks to be the Lord's work that he fails to appreciate the wonder of what he's seeing, what he's experiencing. The revelation of Jesus as God will one day glorify him. So there are times when we are very much like Peter and David as well. We're so busy doing what's important to us that we miss what God is telling us plainly. We too strive to build a house for God who prefers a tent. So the truly lasting achievement is not what we build for God, but what God makes of us through grace given beyond our deserving. Have we been gathering loads of cedar wood and expensive marble, laying stone upon stone to build a life where all is successful and secure, only to find that the place set aside for God is empty and deserted? If so, it may be a time to to set out for the wilderness to find the place where God challenges us to take risks. God may spurn the ornate temples we build, but God never rejects us. When we lay aside our blueprints, our tools, our, and our block, and take up the road as pilgrims in this life, we find our Lord is there, walking beside us. God does tell David that he won't build a home for God. Rather, David's son will build a home for God, will build a temple for God to dwell in. And recall that Solomon is that son that builds the first temple there, but it's never called God's temple, is it? It's always referred to as Solomon's temple. So now let's go back a thousand years into the future after King David and we find God working with us again. A covenant is remembered. Remember that that God made a covenant with David that through you and your sons and, and your descendants, your house will be built forever and ever. So a son in the line of King David is to come into this world. And there's a teenager named Mary who gets news from the angel Gabriel to say, Oh, blessed are you, favored one. You are going to have the child. Your womb is going to house God. So God's going to be working on building the house inside Mary's womb. A child will be born to Mary and Joseph who will bring the world back to God. So God makes his home in Jesus. That is what we call the incarnation. God doesn't want to be up in some ivory tower or tall mountaintop. God wants to be in the nitty gritty of human life. And as the Reverend Dr. Derek Weber writes, David wanted to build a house for God on the tallest hill in Jerusalem, where God could be removed and distanced and, over, and overlook all the people who would have to go out of their way to give obedience to God. But God wanted to build his home a little closer to the deep realities of living in this world so that we would be surprised by God where we live. God wanted to build his home where we sweat and labor, where we work and play, where we laugh and cry, where our hearts are lifted up and often broken and sometimes healed. Friends, God wants to be with us. And that desire reflects God's deep love for us, a longing to be with us. We may be lost, we may be hurt, we may be mad at the world, we may even be mad at God. 
But God still wants to be with us, to bring love and healing into our lives. God wants to live in our homes. So here we are on the threshold of Christmas 2020. Let's open our hearts to God's love for us as God steps onto the thresholds of the, our homes and the threshold of our hearts to bring his love and grace into our lives. Let's be receptive to that. Amen. And now, friends, it's time for our virtual offering. And I continue to thank you for your extravagant generosity toward your church and toward your God. Let's now give a prayer of thanksgiving for the offerings that we will receive during this coming week. Gracious and generous God, we offer our gifts to you, knowing full well we have devoted so much more energy into finding the gifts for our families and much less on the gifts we offer to you. You gave Mary, an unmarried girl, a son, so the world might have a Savior. Her response was so simple. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. May her affirmation of faith and obedience be the gift we offer this day. In Christ we pray. Amen. Now, friends, it's time for us to engage in a time of prayer and to prepare hearts and souls for this time. Let's now sing, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame.
One week left, Lord. Just one week left. Can we get all the things done that we have set before us? Have all the cards been mailed, the greetings extended, the gatherings coordinated, and placed in our calendar for that big last rush before the big day? Have we forgotten anything? Have we forgotten anyone? It would be easy to say, we have forgotten the reason for the season, that phrase which is imprinted on keychains and coffee mugs. We think that if we post the note that says, Jesus is the reason for the season, we will truly be fulfilling our Christmas commitment. How foolish we are. Placing the words on the wall, taped to a bulletin board, on a refrigerator, does not place the words in our hearts. We replace the glorious story of God's incarnate word with tinsel and wrapping paper and believe that we are ready to celebrate. When will we learn? Come to us now, comforting God, with your powerful words of healing. Help us to remember the witness of Mary, a young girl, who never expected to play such a role in salvation history. Put the brakes on our rushing and sit down and sit us down to hear the story of your absolute love for us. Get us ready for the birth of your Son who will become our Savior. Move us from the focus of our festivities to a focus on witnessing about your love through serving others. Challenge us to reach out to people in need, not only with a check to support a particular endeavor, but with actual contact in ministries of sacrifice and service. In such times as this, remind us that we are called to proclaim your love through witness and service. We pray for our nation for healing at this time, and we pray that you continue to guide the health professionals to end this pandemic that we are in. And of course, we ask you to be present with our families and friends, wherever they may be. And we pray for the safety of all people during this final week before Christmas, for those who travel, for those who visit. Please help them to be safe. And we now take time to lift up names to you of those that we know and situations as well that we wish to share with you at this moment in silence. Lord, we ask that you bless those dear ones who we name before you and those situations as well, that you would bring your healing, reconciling, and comforting presence and love to them. Again, Lord, remind us, remind us of the depth of your love for us as we think about the birth of your Son coming up in the next week that we will indeed celebrate. For we offer this prayer in the name of that Son, Jesus, who with you and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God forever and ever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the Spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel celebrate the space we gain. Dreaming, there's a time for her to care. In the Spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to spare. And now, friends, as we close our service, a reminder. 
God loves us deeply. That's why God made a covenant with David that continued to be made through Jesus, King. A king coming into our lives. So indeed, let us open the threshold of our hearts to receive this king, to receive God once again. And while you're doing that this week and inviting others to do the same, make sure you laugh a lot. That you have as much fun as you can this side of the galaxy. That you live in Christ. Enjoy life. Be at peace. Now go in peace. Have a blessed week.